Welcome to The Altitude Show. I'm your host, Dave Brinker. What's up, everybody? Today I have Ryan Lampers on the show. He's a great friend of mine. In my opinion, one of the best hunters on the planet. He is a husband, a father, co-founder of Hunt Harvest Health, the Western Hunting Summit, among other things, with his lovely wife, Hillary. He has lived a crazy adventurous life from Alaska to Russia, basically anywhere you can find mountains where there's nobody else. That's where you're going to find Ryan. He approaches everything methodically and intelligently from his hunting to the way he runs his businesses. He's a very, very interesting human. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Take something from it that you can apply to your life. Have a great day. The Altitude Show is brought to you by Peaks Equipment, the world's leading technical, hard goods, and accessories brand for backcountry enthusiasts. From trekking poles to headlamps to best-in-class gators, Peaks delivers a system of products that work to achieve optimal performance in the harshest conditions. Don't suffer on your hunting adventures. Peaks enables you to thrive on the mountain when everyone else is going home. Visit peaksequipment.com and use code ALTITUDE for 10% off today. That's ALTITUDE for 10% off on peaksequipment.com. Outdoor Class is the new source of premium outdoor education from trusted and knowledgeable experts. For hunters committed to improving their skills, Outdoor Class is the only subscription-based e-learning platform that provides unlimited access to video lessons from the world's most respected experts. Learn from industry leaders like Corey Jacobson, Randy Newberg, Remy Warren, and other experts across all the topics that affect you as a hunter. Make sure to follow Outdoor Class Official on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube and take your game to the next level by going to OutdoorClass.com. You can use code ALTITUDE at checkout for 20% off. That is ALTITUDE at checkout for 20% off at OutdoorClass.com. Welcome, everyone, to the Altitude Show. This is your host, Dave Brinker. And today I have somebody on that I admire very much and has become a great friend of mine. Many of you know him as the Stealthy Hunter, but his real name is Ryan Lampers. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for having me, Dave. Yeah, Appreciate man. Appreciate it, man. What's the, what's the weather doing in Bozeman, Montana today? You know, it's looking very spring-like today. Uh, yeah? Uh, it's kind of cold nights, but, man, we, it's been all over the board. Um, we've had some 62-degree days lately. Uh, and then we'll get down to zero, and then, man, today it's beautiful out, sunshine, cold nights. Muddy. Um, muddy when it warms up. <laughs> oh, dogs tracking dirt in. It's uh, it's one of my wife's, wife's probably least favorite times when uh, we get this thaw, and there's just yeah. – with a dog door and three dogs, man, we get mud tracked in like crazy. Oh, so, man, yeah. I, I, I live there for – for seven years and this from about now till the middle of june was my least favorite time well i guess when bear season started like i started to like it more like april 15th may 1st you start getting a few good days but uh that muddy season is brutal and it's snow like you'll get your last snowstorm in like june but then when that clears up man there's no there's no prettier place to be than the rocky Uh, mountains in the late spring and summer June is spectacular here. We love yeah. it. Um, but yeah, you're right. There's a time frame where I just don't even like going out and feeding the chickens because it is, <laughs> if you know Montana mud, uh, especially out where we live here, it's that clay, slippery, no traction, even underneath the mud. It's just slick as snot. <laughs> For those that don't know, which most of you probably do, Ryan um, is a very well-known uh hunter and uh for good reason there, you know there's a lot of oftentimes in the hunting industry there's people that kind of rise up that may or may not actually be the greatest hunters but maybe they're good at making videos or they're great speakers or whatever it might be and that's fine ryan is genuinely probably one of the best hunters i've ever been with and by nature of being in the industry for 15 years and also being around hunting my entire life that's a big statement i've seen some pretty impressive hunters 
Uh, and you don't just become that overnight. Um, the more I've learned about you, Ryan, this isn't the first endeavor that you've kind of mastered in a way. I know it's not possible to totally master anything, but you've been really good at a few things. I want to talk to you about that because I think there's probably some commonalities about that people can learn from to help them be better at whatever craft they're, you know, pursuing. Um, and one of those things that kind of fascinated me about your past is you used to be a pretty hardcore steelhead fisherman. Mm. Is that true? Yes. Absolutely. Was it just steelhead or did, was that your kind of thing or was it? It was, it was a little bit of everything. Yeah. And first off, Dave, appreciate those kind words, man. That, uh, that means a lot. I, I can't take credit for being the greatest hunter <laughs> or anything like that, but I appreciate you saying that. Um, no, yeah. The, the fishing bug bit me uh, in my younger years and that is really what led me to where I am today. I think it's, it's similar in that, uh, when I was young, my dad was heavily into fishing and hunting as well but where's this at are we in washington this is back in washington state okay. west coast uh rainforest type you know places um we grew up started in uh monroe washington lived in snohomish washington most of my life and then uh then you know i found my wife we got married we settled on a house out in granite falls washington so yeah heavy uh uh, west coast there and yeah growing up it was uh my dad has always been big into hunting but more so like birds you know a lot of pheasant really into the dogs and, and watching the dogs work and so we did a crud ton of chucker hunts and pheasant trips and we treated these things as like a almost like a backcountry hunt because if you're familiar with chucker hunting you know it takes a special person to just keep grinding it out on those steep mountain hills. And, uh, my dad definitely taught me, uh, to not have any quit, even though we're just chasing birds all over the mountain. They say, ch I've it's never chucker hunted, but they say chucker hunting's harder than a lot of the Western hunting for big game. You put more miles on chucker hunting and probably burn up more elevation ups and down than any big game hunt you're going to do if i'm being honest that's it is crazy really difficult i mean you go out and you accomplish uh you know a bag limit back then it was six chucker um probably still is you know you did something that day if you can if you can put six chucker in the dirt retrievals and uh and wrap that up man that was a great day hunt really great day hunt and you earned it like you earn the heck out of that bag limit. That yeah, day, they definitely so. don't live in easy terrain. No, you're not sitting in a blind and you're not waiting for them to come in. <laughs> I know <laughs> you're a big sure. I know you're a big proponent of sitting in stands. Oh man, I uh <laughs> it's funny. Now this is all just in in jest, but I sure. I love making fun of uh folks that do sit in tree stands for <laughs> white tail, black tail, ducks, geese. Um but we're just, I'm always joking around. I just don't have, I just don't have it in me to do that. So I try to make fun. Of you don't have the patience do. for it. I don't. And yet I can be out of a blind and Brian Call is, has called me out on this many times because I could sit on the top of a mountain on a ridge on a great glass and perch and I'll sit there all day long as if I'm in a tree stand. So I don't know why the tree stand bothers me, but it does. I just love, uh, yeah. I it's a valid call out from things. Brian. That's a it valid is. call because I, I've been on whitetail hunts, spe uh, specifically my favorite place that I've ever whitetail hunted, like in Kansas, where it's basically just a glassing perch. It's so open. I can see, shoot, sometimes I could see a half mile or even further. Yeah. Um, and so I'm seeing deer all day. But my least favorite whitetail hunt that I've ever done was in Illinois. Not because I don't like Illinois or it wasn't a great hunt. It's just from my personality, I could only see in bow range. And if there was a slow day, like I remember one specifically, I had the flu and uh, <laughs> I sat all day. And I think I had a doe, a fawn, and a spike come by in visual range. And it was one of the most boring days of my, and miserable. It was like a close to, I think it was like 10 degrees. And in Illinois, that is freaking cold i mean it is because it's so humid uh and so um 
I get you. You got to you got to be able to see something going. And yeah. I think that's the cool thing about a glassing perch is because every time you throw up your glasses, something new could be in the opening that you're looking at, right? Yeah, your mind races. You you're you're like there's potential. Like right. there's potential for something to be 2 miles away and you get your spotter and your glass up and you're seeing it and you know we're getting ready to go into spring bear and most of the day you're sitting in a spot or two and mm-hmm. you're just glassing edges and, and areas for where they feed and mm-hmm. and it can be for some very boring or very slow but yeah we're literally just like somebody out in ohio sitting in a tree stand you know they're just sitting there for most of the day waiting for something mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. pop up but we're continually you know glassing new country and there's always expectations to see something great so so you, you're you're growing up. Your dad's into bird hunting, and fishing. You're in yeah. Western Washington, which I can relate to, being from Western yeah. Oregon. So you kind of you got a little bit of salt in your blood. Absolutely. No, it's uh, I've got a weird background, uh, Dave. If I'm being honest, because you know my dad, he was a construction worker um, out of the gates, and then when I was probably four or five years old, he's a heavy fisherman to the point that. You know, he was into steelhead and he was into trout, but really into steelhead. And, and there's this uh, there's this bait that works really good for steelhead fishing, and it's sand shrimp. If you're on the if you live on the west coast or you're a sturgeon guy on the west coast, you know what sand shrimp are. Technically, they're a ghost shrimp, um, but that was a great bait. And back in the '70s, he would go out, go down to the beach use the old clam gun, you know, thumb over the hole, suction clam gun, and spit that tube out and try to grab a couple. Hey, grab a dozen or or a few, and you go fish. Um, Well, he loved it so much, he turned that into a business. Like, he he helped in uh, building this better way to pump sand shrimp out of the the salt, uh, out of the the beach at low tide. It went from clam gun to – suction pump to water pump and then you're literally using a pvc wand and you're blowing (laughs) blowing water onto the sand and uh you know if if you don't know what sand shrimp are they're they're actually considered an invasive species they they are what (laughs) makes sand soupy and soft out on the beach are they really an invasive species i didn't know that are yes no way where did they come from that's where they classify them. I'm not sure when they came or where they came from, you know. Because we used to go pump but, sand shrimp all the time, oh, yeah. you know, here. That's uh, Like you said, it's the for salmon and steelhead. Oh, there's it's money, right? It's money, and, yeah. And they're burrowers. So they, you know, they burrow down and they make sand soft on the, on the coast. And oh. we used to do huh. that. And so our business started with sand shrimp. And uh, we grew that business to be the biggest bait business on the west coast bait and tackle and all things everything what was it called fishing raise bait so for folks on the coast you know does it still exist today oh yeah yeah it's going really i left that i left it four years ago when we moved here Uh, okay in great hands with my cousin joey Mm -hmm. pyburn he's uh, still over there running it it's the family business it supports my folks it supports his family okay this is all making sense to me and i can't believe we've never talked about this because i think i've bought raised bait before if you've steelhead fished in washington or the oregon coast you definitely have or trout fished with worms or if you've saltwater fished with anything from anchovies sardines herring you name it it's how are you guys getting your herring were you going out and and uh, netting them or just catching them so we'd go out um boats would go out live haul these things back to these special pens that we'd have built on the docks down into comaneros and we would free swim those things out of the boat hull into these pens and we'd let them sit there for a couple weeks swim around kind of lose what was in their belly um sounds bad but starve them i guess shake some of the fat off of them put them on a treadmill and that would get them to be a better quality they wouldn't shake their scale so much when guys were fishing them and cut plugging them for salmon so yeah we do that and then have a whole crew back at the processing plant uh sizing the herring um you know culling them putting them on trays vacuum packing them putting them in a flash freezer freezing them up and putting them on pallets and from there they go wherever they go into 
sportsman's warehouses, bass pros, uh, you know, a lot of lodges in Alaska and, and BC. And you were, you were the one, if I remember correctly, you were putting a lot of miles on distributing yeah. that every week, yeah. right? Yep. So I did a lot of driving in my prior life for sure. <laughs> Probably, you know, I was doing, you know, sometimes, oftentimes 18, 20 hour days, just on the road, driving, hauling stuff from here to there. Um, you know, I didn't mind it for the longest time. I, I just considered driving that long, like building mental toughness. <laughs> it was like, uh, it sounds weird. Like you're sitting in one spot, but you know, grinding out a 20 hour day, um, takes a little something. So I figured I was just working on the mental toughness over in the, uh, the so, sea of red. So, lights so you're building a bait Washington. business. So I assume, I assume at the same time you're honing your craft with specifically steelhead, correct? Were you a big, yeah. were you a Chinook guy? Absolutely. Yeah. But more that, yeah, we did a lot of uh, salmon fishing out in the salt water. Okay. My whole family is, um, very when you well say saltwater, are you saying the bay or are you saying out, out in the, the open ocean? Out okay. in the Puget Sound. Yeah. Yep. So we fished everything from the San Juan Islands all the way down down south, um, down to the Calets, you know, the Columbia yeah. uh, fishery down there, buoy 10 and all that. So, um, yeah, running the business, we were always, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to test the products, right, Dave? So we were always playing on all these different fisheries. Um, like I said, my family, my own uncle, my dad, they just absolutely live for being on the boat, saltwater fishing, catching black mouth in the, in the salt, um, you know, coho during season, you name it, every, all five species of salmon. And, uh, and then steelhead, you know, in the winter months and oftentimes in the summer when they weren't too busy, but, um, no, steelheading was a huge part of my world. Were you fly but fishing the, for steelhead or were you just bait fishing? little bit of both and yeah. in my younger days it was all bait fishing you know it was terminal tackle it was spoon spinners um jigs sand shrimp you know things like mm -hmm. that drifting uh running them under floats and then uh it's funny because um not trying to sound arrogant but i got really good like i got pretty good and i i would uh i was standing out i guess in a crowd when we were on the banks of chasing steelhead um and that was just because my dad was the best at it and he taught me well but um that led me to uh a career in alaska being a fly fishing guide so i went from the bait world i love fly fishing um did it for mm, my, in my later teens just as much and then that got me to Alaska, fishing kings up there on the Alagnac River, fishing all five species of salmon and pike and grayling and all the things. And uh, that that put me up there for um, seven years doing that. That's where I met my wife. Uh, it got me over to see Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. It put me over there on the steelhead project where we were fly fishing for steelhead and trying to learn the fishery and um, get all kinds of data collected for the biologists so that they could, they kind of had a better idea what they had because they have the last wild salmon or wild steelhead around, like, uh, the last with zero hatchery effect. That's what they have. I was going to ask you that cause that's a subjective, West side. Yeah, that's a debatable yeah, sure. term, right? Yep. Yep. Zero influence with hatcheries, um, over yep. there. Uh, that's, and a, is that true today a, still? You yes. Think? Yep, it is. It's a west coast of Kamchatka Peninsula mm -hmm. over there. And then, uh, gosh, we fished the eastern side of the peninsula, and that was big rivers, uh, the Japonova River, which goes forever. It's the land of volcanoes. Um, we fished some incredible places, tons of hike-ins, uh, just helicopter around and fished these places, did a lot of raft floating, uh, guiding clients down rivers, catching rainbows on fly rods. And so fly fishing definitely took over my life. And, uh, I was into the, into that space for quite a few years. And what's interesting is, you know, I ended up getting married, um, back in the nineties. And then, you know, I was gone for five to six months every year in the early years of Hill and I's marriage. And so I just hit a point where I couldn't do it anymore. So, uh, I came back and I took over 
retook over the family business, grew that in the bait world. So I went from bait to fly fishing to bait <laughs> and grew that business, retired my dad and mom. Um, we just said, step away from the business and, um, we don't like how you guys run this anymore. So you guys go over here and you guys got this nice piece of property and you stay there and out of our business and we'll grow this thing. And that's what we did. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my beginnings. Were you hunting that whole time? Absolutely. Yep. Every okay. Fall, every fall. Gotcha. So, uh, when I went, met my wife, it wasn't as much archery back then because I would oftentimes be in Alaska until the end of September. So I was coming back, uh, that first week in October and that dove me right into rifle season for a meal there. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd do that hot and heavy. And then obviously November, and then we'd, we'd tackle those chucker again, you know, um, but we would miss September in those early months. Were you in into years. archery, even though you couldn't hunt the oh, yeah. season, obviously yeah, you were, I was okay. into all of it. So I'd shoot, shoot the bow a lot. Um, did a lot of muzzleloader hunts back then, hmm. uh, wherever, you know, not really weapon specific. It was what, what tag gave me a great option to go hunt a mm -hmm. time frame that fit, um, put us in position to be in these great places. So if a muzzleloader was the tag that did it, I would grab a muzzleloader tag or a rifle or an archery. It was just, you know, no, uh, no snobbery towards any weapon. <laughs> it was just what was going to get us out there mastering steelhead mm -hmm. is that's kind of the pinnacle of fly fishing, right? I'm not a fly fisherman, yeah. but I, I've been around fishing my whole life. And I think that's, that's a true statement. At least it is. It's, uh, I think that's a safe statement. To okay. Make. I think, okay. Fly, I think fly fish and steelhead is kind of the cream of the crop. Yeah. Yep. It seems yep. like you have a knack for getting really good at these things. What do you attribute it to? Like specifically oh, with that, I like can, you're a young guy. Yeah. I don't know. I was an idiot. Probably still I'm kind of pretty much an idiot. But when I, especially when I was younger, I was kind of an airhead. I didn't really uh, approach anything intelligently, right? It's, mm -hmm. But it seems like you had a very, you're kind of an introvert. Uh, there you go. There's your answer. <laughs> so you, you, I've noticed this about you, Ryan. You, you, you listen a lot and you think a lot. But then when you take action, it's a, it's an intelligent approach. And I think that's how you approach it. And I'm making an assumption. I think this is right. But this is why I want to dig into it. With steelhead fishing back then or with your hunting endeavors now, is that what it is? Is it like that thoughtful approach, like more of smart hunting as opposed to just blunt force hunting and fishing? I think so. I think, uh, you know, when you ask what it was that um, – I guess, got me into it and got me so good at what I did back then. It was, uh, I was very antisocial. I was introverted, um, another word for it. So I wasn't out going to parties with my friends. I was, I was wanting to get up the next morning and hit the river on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning. Um, and I was, I don't know, I was, I've never been a drinker. It just never sat well with me. So partying was the last thing I wanted to do. And, uh, and I guess maybe that was because my parents weren't either, uh, just never done well with alcohol or anything like that. So my, my, uh, where I thrived was in the woods on the mountain or on a river. And, uh, I think just not needing so not needing attention, not needing someone there next to me all the time. I could go days without talking to anybody and just talk to myself. And be, be Which fine. is, that's, that's a real talent. That's hard to do. I mean, I, I like being alone just as much as the next guy. But after a few days, I like talking to somebody. And it's not just because I need attention. It doesn't, at least I don't think so. I think it's, it's more like if I'm hunting and I'm hunting alone for a couple of days or even just... I have one exciting morning or evening. I like sharing it. I like, I like, I like, like, I want to call somebody and be like, dude, you won't believe what just happened. I had six bulls bugling or I caught this fish or whatever. It almost seems anticlimactic sometimes to not share experiences. Yeah. Uh, Cause that makes them better at least to me. Absolutely. I would agree with that too. And, and there's a lot of things that I've done 
by myself that I didn't get to share with others. So, um, you know, you can tell stories later, but sometimes it's not the same, Mm -hmm. but no, I think, uh, I think my awkwardness and my antisocial ways just, uh, it afforded me more time on the river. Uh, and I was perfectly content doing that standing on that river bank from as soon as the sun comes up till the very end of the day. And, you know, I get a lot of that from my dad, no doubt about it. He's the same way. He's, uh, he's not, he, he will listen and he will think. And it's funny. My uncles are the same way. They'll literally sit there like, uh, it, they, they think a lot about what they're hearing and then mm-hmm. they try to put it together and piece it together and puzzle it. And, um, must've got it from them because that's kind of how I, I approach fishing, steelheading. There's definitely a knack to it. Uh, if you don't have somebody teaching you, mentoring you how to catch steelhead with regularity, uh, even bait fishing or fly fishing, you're going to, you're going to struggle and people go years without actually getting into it. And oh, for sure. My, my, fish on. It's- my dad and his best friend, I would consider a couple of the best fishermen down where I, where, where we live. And his, his best friend is just cause he's more retired than my dad is daylight to dark almost every day, uh, yeah. throughout the year, at least when it's the rivers aren't blowing out, you know? Yeah. And sometimes even when they are, but one, he, and he soaks everything up that he reads and he sees and he just gets better and better and better and better. And I feel bad because I'm so busy in this phase of my life. Uh, I don't, I, I really want to go out and learn like all of these fishing spots and tactics and strategies that my dad and his friend Eric have in their head. Yeah. Someday they're going to be gone. And that's sad to me because that's a lot of years of knowledge and wisdom that we could all. So I actually just texted them last night, like, Hey, I'm going to take a day off next week and I, I want to go. And I grew up going and I'm, I'm not a bad fisherman. I make, I can go catch fish, but this is a whole nother level. Like, and that's, and that's kind of how hunting is. It's like, there's levels to it. And, yeah. I, but it seems like the consistent thing that I'm seeing with you and people like them is the ability to, just approach it more intelligently as opposed to just bombing down to the river with a six pack of beer and just, you know, hammering the same holes and the same lures or bait that everybody else is. I don't know. It's just this more of a thoughtful I think there's approach a focus. to it. There's a focus to and it, focus. no doubt about okay. it. Because I think most guys, you know, I was a guide forever. So I could see, I could identify what was not working mm-hmm. and, and explain to people why. And, uh, and you know what, what tends to happen when say fishing's tough, like you just haven't caught a steelhead all morning, guys will just get into going through the motions, but the next level guy that's consistent as I'll get out, he's the guy that is constantly thinking, constantly changing, changing leader lengths, changing speed, changing colors, changing scents, changing, whether it's steelhead fishing or blackmouth fishing out in the salt. And, um, you know, it's that guy who never quits changing things up, um, Mm. figuring it out, dialing it in, whatever you want to label, you want to put on it. But, uh, it's all about figuring it out. And a lot of people just end up going through the motions. You can relate that to hunting as well. Uh, when things get tough, things aren't working. They're really willing to throw in the town, the towel and just say, ah, this hunt had too many people or uh, there's just not enough deer this year or, uh, you know, this, that, the other the weather's bad or it's foggy. There's a million excuses or you figure it out and find a way. And my, uh, my dad and my uncle, uncle Ron, he's, uh, if you talk to the elite groups on the coast, you will hear those names, Ray and Ron Lampers, the Lampers clan come up in all those elite circles when it comes to blackmouth fishing in the saltwater in the San Juan. Those guys are always putting up derby wins um, because they just figure it out. They're so good and so detail oriented Mm. and they take every single thing down to the science and, and they're very, very into it. Uh, They're like scientists, but they're fishing. Okay, so that's that's. Per- I'm glad you brought that up because that's the other thing I've noticed about you hunting with you, and just hanging out around you is is you're very detail oriented, 
and I'm not. So I've always admired people like that because, you know, uh, there's pluses and minuses to that, right? It can, it can also slow you down. It can also it make can you overthink. Your crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it can drive your kids crazy. Well, and it can make you overthink things. things sometimes, but <laughs> the benefits of it are, are, are plentiful, especially when it comes to hard, really, really, really hard things that take a lot of preparation and a lot of thought right like yeah. standing there on a bank like it's not easy to change like if something's not working on the on the bank you're on a river you got two or three guys next to you and you're casting and like it's 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 a little bit of a competition it, you feel like urgency like you want it to work like maybe the morning's kind of waning the bite's kind of going away you're like damn it it's hard to take five minutes take a breath pull reel in your your stuff change leader length or change corky colors or whatever whatever however you're fishing maybe try a different go but go to eggs instead of shrimp or whatever it is that's hard to do I, I, it's hard for me to do because i get impatient and i'm like no this works i know it worked it worked a week it ago worked yesterday but the yeah. really good guys that are standing next to me i'll notice they're not scared to sit down and just my dad will do this he'll just stop casting and he'll just sit there and watch for like an hour yeah. And just be like, he's like, no, I'm not going to waste my energy. I'm not going to waste my energy until there's some fish biting or I'm going to sit and think about maybe I'm going to change it up, but I'm not going to sit here and just burn myself out. And I think it obviously transfers over to, to hunting very well. Like, yeah. right. If it's, uh, the, 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 the best hunters that I've ever met, one of the things that I've seen in common with them is, is they have quite a bit of time to work with. And therefore, like they take a chunk of time. They're like, I'm staying here for 10 days no matter what. And that allows them to go, you know what? This morning sucks, but it's okay. I'm patient. I'm going to, maybe I'm going to dry out some clothes. I'm going to eat some food. I'm going to drink some coffee and kind of get my gear ready because tonight it's going to turn on um, yeah. as opposed to just getting frustrated and being frazzled and being uh, impatient and leaving or bombing into a basin with the wind wrong and screwing it all up or whatever it is. But it seems like that, that, uh, that patience. And then again, just kind of that smart approach, like, no, I have time. I'm confident that it's going to work out and I'm just going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to think through this. Yeah, no, for sure. And I don't know what that saying is where, you know, how many, how many people, uh, were this close to being successful when they gave up? Like, who knows? Nobody knows. Right. But I think there's a few guys out there that they know that it's just like in the elk woods. Every time you shoot a bull, if you think back, it was probably the slowest hunt that you thought was never going to happen. And then 10 minutes later, you're staring down at this great bull that you just arrowed. And it happens just like that. Whereas if somebody would have quit 10 minutes ago, you'd be going back telling all your buddies about how lousy and the calling, they just weren't rutting and there's people and all the things. Um, but it, the, the steelhead thing that you were bringing up, um, you know, it's funny because most people don't know this little world that exists out there uh, in the steelhead world, especially hatchery holes. There's always a, you know, a hatchery run fish is, it can be debated whether it's good or bad. The fact is there's a lot of, hatcheries that release a lot of steelhead those steelhead come back and they kind of hang out below the creek and and you get to these places in the winter time and um there'll be 30 40 50 guys standing around that and there's fish there's fish there and they've seen everything um and a lot of guys end up just going through the motions but if you're if you go in there and you know what you're doing and you're confident and can consistently pull your two steelhead out, bring them home, and do the walk of fame going back, you know, <laughs> past the those 50 guys, you know. And they're all um, like, what the hell? That son of a bitch. Yeah. That Poacher. Was, what's that kid doing? <laughs> yeah. But what sets some people apart is they are not just going through the motions. So winter steelheading is very cold. It sucks taking your gloves off and retying everything because your fingers are frozen. And yep. sometimes they don't even work, you know. Right. But changing up might be that one thing that does. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there was anything consistent about steelheading was that you could not be consistent. You had to constantly change, mm -hmm. figure it out, figure out a different way of, of uh, putting that thing in front of their face, different color, different size, 
like I said, different stank. It's just so many different things, little things. Mm -hmm. Most people are, they're like, well, this corky worked for me on the last five fish, but steelhead are weird. All of a sudden, like one day, one color works. That color that worked yesterday doesn't work at all. And there's a lot of fisheries that are like that. Kokanee are the same way if you're if you're chasing kokanee in some of the lakes and, and things like that. But yeah, I think um, my upbringing was my dad before I could drive, way before I could drive, he'd go run his bait route on the on the Snoqualmie and the Skykomish and all those those uh, river systems. He would bring me up there in the morning, drop me off, and I would sit there amongst all these big adults. You know, I'm like you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. And, uh, he just dropped me off. It was a different time. And I'd sit there in those cold winter months, standing around 30, 40 dudes, all trying to catch a steelhead. And I just figured it out. Like I learned how to beat all of those guys. It was very competitive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I loved that part of it. And I was perfectly fine standing there on the bank all day long until my dad picked me up at the end of the day because I was very okay just being in my own head and trying yeah. to figure out, focused on how the heck am I going to beat all these guys around me and, and get a fish on the bank. Mm -hmm. um, they're not biting, and, and that was the singular focus. So, <laughs> Yeah, that thing you mentioned about uh, uh, sort of – like a one minute period making a trip a success as opposed to a failure. It's not even one minute. It's like a half a second, especially bow hunting or even fishing. Uh, but specifically to bow hunting, since we're both bow hunters, I think it's the most uh, realistic thing to talk about is my most memorable successful hunts have been trips like you described where it's like, Everything that's going to go wrong has gone wrong. It's miserable. Like I'm actually sp specifically right now, you can't see it, but over here, someone was in my, in my office the other day. They're like, which out of, out of these heads in here, what's your favorite memory? And I pointed to this, this mule deer I have over here. It's, it's just a, it's a nice mature three point, but it's nothing crazy. You know, it doesn't score crazy, but it's my favorite memory because that hunt, that buck uh, was on the last day and actually the last hour of a miserably hot, very uneventful. This was, this was my, uh, my heart mountain hunt here several years ago. We've talked about this. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but this anyways, I remember, uh, this buck spotted him at daylight. This is my last chance to get it done. And this hunt is in Oregon for those who don't know. And it's very special to me because my grandfather, uh, was hunting this mountain in the sixties when it was like alive with giant mule deer. And, um, and I've grown up going to this area, but I'd never arrowed a mule deer. I never even had the tag. I've been with several people that had, but I'd never had it myself anyway. So I'm finally here. Uh, and, but now I've made it seven days without airing a buck and I've passed some other ones up, but my buddy, Matt Brimmer and I were sitting on this room at daylight that, that day, that last day. And I'm like, you know, like you're getting antsy. You're like, God, please find a buck. Please find a buck. And I'd like seen like two mature bucks all week. It was like terrible. And then like the first place I put my binos that morning, it's like, oh, right there. Boom. Nice buck. Long story short, this buck moves off into this juniper, like almost like a mesa. But it was like disappeared into a sea of junipers in an area I've never been um, and they all look the same. It's totally flat. There's no landmarks. Just disappeared. And I looked over at Matt. I'm like, <laughs> usually I wouldn't even go over there because it'd be most of the time it'd be a waste of time. You're just going to jump them or whatever. But it was our last day. So I'm like, dude, we got nothing to lose. Let's just go over there and let's, we have all day. We're just going to take one step at a time, class, sit down one step at a time. And we're going to find that thing. He's going to be bedded under one of those trees. It's like a ha it's like a quarter mile wide. <laughs> And we went over there and that's what we did. Literally five steps, real slow, glass, sit down, take a drink of water. We spent, I can't remember how many hours it was, but I think by like two o'clock, there's his tines under a juniper. I'm like, I, I went around a tree. I'm like, oh my God, there he is. And he doesn't see us yet. Long story short, I arrowed that buck. And when the arrow hit that buck, the relief and the 
sort of the the change in course of the week. I mean, we were it was like ninety degrees. We were dirty. We were totally roasted, sunburnt, dehydrated, hungry, tired, all the things. But when the arrow hit that buck, it was like I was in paradise. And like everything changed. All of the energy changed. The, the moment was like went from like the most disappointing week that I'd had in hunting to one of the most amazing feelings. Like I could see the the peak my grandpa used to take pictures on and like that buck was there in my hands and like it was really an amazing feeling but to your point five seconds before that when I wasn't sure if the stock was going to work out I was like man here I am in my 30s I finally get to this mountain I have all the skills I'm a good hunter and I'm gonna fail like my grandpa I mean he wouldn't care but still I wanted to succeed but that's a really good point that bow hunters especially learn since most of the time you bow hunt you fail yeah no it's it's totally true um and you know what was like i like what you said when you think of you know your most special bucks often for me it's how difficult it was to attain it you it's those bucks that you really earned earned whether it was the physical conditions the weather the suck factor, the, you know, putting in seven days of hardly seeing anything and yet you're continuing on and then you finally get it to happen. There's, it's hard to beat that. It's just like anything. It feels better when you earn it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, nobody, I mean, I guess some people like free money, but (laughs) money feels better when you earn it as well. It does. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I think, uh, when I think of some of my, my favorite hunts, it's just that it's, it's whether I took it in in this incredibly beautiful place, like it's where they, it's where they end up taking you, or it's how hard it took for you to actually make it happen. And that's why I really, really love, and like on your story, those last day um, success stories. Like, you don't, you don't want them, like even. you don't wish for them, but you do love them when they happen. It's, and see, you know, what's the old <laughs> adage? It's always out there in the hunting space. It's why, why pass on the first day? Right. I don't know. Yeah, don't pass something the know. first day that you would take on the last day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I completely 100% disagree because I love to hunt. So I would prefer to say pass on the first day what you can shoot on the last. Because now you got 10 days of learning of adventure, of fun, of figuring things out and dialing it in and maybe finding that best buck of your life. So I love those last day bucks. Most times these days we build these 10 day hunts and then half of the trip, the front end, unless just some amazing thing walks out in front of you. Most of the times we're not even pulling our bow off our pack or our rifle out of the case in our pack. Um, until the second half of the trip anyway, because we're sitting back and we're observing everything. We want to see what's there and we're not going in. We're not going in to kill in the first few days on a 10 day trip. We're expecting to kill on the end. Mm. And usually that's what happens. It's usually, I don't even know how many times I don't have a number, but those second to last day or last day, even down to the last half hour, I've got a stack of those adventures that are, really tall that have happened. So obviously it's not by chance that's happening. You you are it's it's probably because you're you're spending the first part of your trip sort of strategizing, learning everything, and then you're probably making your most aggressive moves towards the end. Is that why it's yeah. happening? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's it's figuring it out. It goes into the whole uh kind of researching, studying, figuring out what's the most mature buck on this. I mean if I'm looking at a this great buck here and I still have eight days left. Maybe there's an older one here that would be really cool to take off this mountain. So, mm-hmm. um, perfectly happy to sit back, possibly not fill that tag and just wait to see and try to figure out, you know, more areas where you're able to maybe potentially find a better buck or a better bull or whatever you're hunting. Mm-hmm. So I love the, the sitting back and observing part um, the first half of a trip and then getting aggressive on the second half. And it goes with rifle hunting as well as bow hunting. And I just feel like, man, shooting something the first day or the second day, um, you know, I, I just wasted a lot of challenge and adventure. (laughs) I've got the days carved out. That's what I'm here for. I'm not just here to bring meat back. It's a big part of it. 
I'm here for the adventure part. I want to learn this range. I want to learn their behavior. I want to learn how they're using this area that I'm focused on. And uh, the only way you get to do that is if you spend the time, sit back, observe, look at it from a distance, and then eventually um, kind of put it all together and go find your success on it. For sure. But that delayed gratification is hard for people. I mean, I struggle with that. I, I, call, I, I can't remember. You and I were talking the other day, and I said, Ryan, I got to stop shooting five points. Mm. You got to help me. And you're like, you got to pass those, man. You got to let them walk by. And I'm like, I can't. It's so hard. Well, you know, and, and yeah. I don't always have 10 days. Like, you know, I'm, I'm probably involved in, in too much work and kids yeah. and family and all that stuff. So it, um, oftentimes I do it because I'm like, okay, like last year was a good example. I shot, a, well, he, he, the bull I shot was like on the fourth day of Oregon season. And to be to be fair, I, I couldn't totally see all of his antlers. I just saw eye guards and stuff coming through the brush at like 20 yards, and I shot him, and I got up to him, and it was totally happy, but it was definitely a small bull that I probably shouldn't have shot on that day. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I am not known for shooting big stuff because I, can't, I have a really hard time letting stuff walk by me. Um, yeah. And uh, so, you know, but I think a lot of people are like that. Maybe it's because they don't have enough time. Yeah, I think Maybe that has a lot. To, yeah, I, I think everybody's different too. Everybody's schedules are different. I yeah. am super blessed to have the job I do, the wife I do, that can cover things while I'm gone. So, mm -hmm. you know, the way I look at it is, I'm going to spend a lot of time. I'm going to have a lot of trips built around my fall season. So, I don't need to take that first one to fill the freezer. I know I'm going to get that meat. I'm looking for adventure and challenge and meat. But man, realistically, that's not everybody's situation. I couldn't do that in my 20s, even most of my 30s, mm. um, with the job I had and and the limited time and you know all that. And people are, you know, getting into their careers and families and all these things. I mean, let's face it, I'm probably in the minority because I do have the time I have. So right. it's definitely not for everyone. So I fully understand. You know, we all hunt for different reasons. Um, taking that first critter that comes by that could, that could keep somebody as happy as yeah, make somebody as happy as possible. And that's, that's good on them. So. Yeah. And it's important to know what you're measuring yourself by, right? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yeah. Because most of us don't have that, you know, 10 to 14 day, uh, range to put into a hunt necessarily. You know, a lot of guys, they might, they might get five days off work. And it's their elk hunt, and it's like, dude, I'm shooting the first legal bull that comes by me, and they're stoked, and that's awesome. Yeah. That's what I always tell people, like being around this industry a bunch. Oftentimes, just because by nature of social media and magazines and stuff, everybody's going out for their 380 bull or the 180 buck or the this or the that, and I'm like, yeah. that's cool. You know, it's it's totally up to you what your goals are, but you should have a little bit of realism in there too. If, if you don't have the time, the knowledge, the area, the genetics, the age, like there's a lot of factors that go into people like you taking these mature animals. It's not like you just, it's not only because you're a good hunter, like that's part of it, but it's also because you are hunting areas with these animals that they grow that bit, that they have the genetics, they have the age, but you also have the time to, yeah. to make sure. And then also you have to be, you know, skillful, but that's most of us, uh, and most of the, you know, especially with the way tags are getting now, it's really hard to get premium tags where in these trophy units or, you know, even a lot of these general units, especially on the on the coast over here, um, in Oregon or a lot of the general units, it's, it's really hard to find a mature animal sometimes. Yeah. Or if not just that, a, an animal with, you know, that's, that's, book or whatever you want to call it like the 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 really big stuff i mean they're they're there but for a lot of people they just don't it's not realistic to think that that's your actual goal right no i mean yeah giant animals aren't everywhere so you know expecting to go out and get one every year is is not really realistic in today's era right um, if you're a public land hunter no doubt about it um but you know if you are so into this experience and this adventure that you take the time to study up and do all this research, you and I are probably similar in that we think about hunting a lot. Like it's not something we just do in the fall. 
it, it's January, February, March. Like right now, I'm up at the end of the day and I'm researching maps and I'm planning out hunts and I'm looking for new areas. And I've got friends that we get on the phone and we'll talk for hours. Mark Livesey is one of them. We'll talk <laughs> hours on just like, what do you think about this spot and what's the potential here? And mm -hmm. and that's just kind of how we've we've tweaked our life to where we can do this and it's always on the top of our head. So that's not everybody's world. Uh, everybody hunts for different reasons again. And, um, you know, we're just different in that we want to challenge ourselves and try to try to find mature animals on public land. Um, and, and that's, that's the goal every year and they're out there. They absolutely are. But, um, even a, a very skilled hunter is going to struggle unless he has the time to do it yeah. Um, yeah without the time and that's why we build these trips 10 days uh without the time you got so many factors going against right. you uh weather and it's just there's days down that you're just not able yeah. to hunt what's your what, uh what do you factor like percentage wise on a 10-day trip of down, down days like um I mean, it varies. Late season, it can be half your trip is uh, fogged in and you're just waiting for those breaks. Uh, so you're paying attention to the weather on your Garmin inReach and you're trying to see, am I going to have a window here? And uh, does it make sense to stay here uh, with the forecast that is before us? And um, early season, it's there's not much. Um, if you're learning new country, expect, I always expect it to take four, five, six days to learn the area, boots on the ground, not the e-scouting stuff, boots on the ground and start learning the behaviors of the animals in that specific area. Um, those aren't necessarily down days, but they are days where you're not even really thinking about knocking an arrow. You're just thinking mm -hmm. about where do, where do I need to be to glass? Where do I need to observe, be to observe this area? And, mm -hmm am I going to even have a chance at flinging an arrow in this basin or is this yeah. something that's just not going to happen? So, but those late season hunts, um, I mean, I'll have trips where I'm, you know, 30, 40 hours in a tent without getting out of it because of the wind and the, and the fog. And you're just literally sitting there. Um, hopefully you've downloaded a movie or two onto your phone because <laughs> it gets, it's pretty boring. Or you yeah. have a good hunting partner that likes to talk a lot. So, like uh, Brian Call. That's why I hunt with Brian Call. He's <laughs> always entertaining with the stories. Um, or you just got to be good and comfortable in your own skin and be able to, uh, you know, be in your own head for that many hours. And I can do that. Um, I think these lucky. skills you've developed through hunting and fishing and by nature of running your family business probably translate well over into just general life too. Like you seem like a patient person, uh, that, that approaches things intelligently, like, and you have a couple businesses of your own now, right? Um, yeah. do you have to exercise a lot of the same muscles? Yeah. So my, resilience again, like the, the slowness that I make decisions permeates all aspects of life. My wife will tell you that sometimes it, it, it works and it's great and she loves it. And sometimes she absolutely hates it. Um, I joke that I'm sloth like in most things, like whether that's making a decision on some contract or making some decision, business decision, like looking ahead, I'm trying to weigh the pros and the cons and it takes me time. And I've just like looking for, you know, a truck or looking for a trailer or looking for a bike for the kids. Uh, I spend way too much time researching and trying to see, like I said, pros, cons, what's good, what's bad. Is this a better one to get for them? Or is this one a better one to get? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's annoyingly slow. So I don't know. Um, my wife would tell you, yeah, it's, it's definitely permeated everything in my world, I think. But, so. but the the resilience and the patience and all that like transfer pretty well over to your entrepreneur because you're pretty entrepreneurial i i, I didn't know that about your background it, i mean it seems like you you come from come from a family of entrepreneurs right absolutely and that yeah, that I mean, tends to be the case with people that grew up in hunting and fishing families because yeah hunting and fishing are pretty they there's a lot of things that transfer right over to building a business and hunting it's like 
resilience and patience and yeah. hard work and struggle, 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 failure, 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 failure. Um, I've seen a lot of these great hunters and fishermen tend to be pretty great entrepreneurs. Yeah, my, I mean, my first entrepreneurial gig was uh, I started my own business um, in my early 20s when I was not guiding in Alaska. I would come home and I was, I started a, uh, a business in Washington State. I would go meet with uh, property owners and I would lease these lakes from them. Mm-hmm. And then I would take on the responsibilities of stocking these lakes with triploid trout and you know giant rainbows and and then i would take people out and i'd do fly casting lessons and i'd teach them how to fly fish and teach them everything from float tubing to just standing on the bank and and cast an entire fly line you know all those things and it was fun and i did that for years and uh you know i would give a percentage to the landowner i'd make these deals and that was my first you know, self-made business was that, and, uh, it was what I love to do. And then you get to a point where it's like, this doesn't excite me anymore. So I got to move on and do something else. But, um, yeah. Well, okay. So that's an interesting topic. Uh, (laughs) that's called adventure and you like adventure, right? Absolutely. So I, I'd imagine you're the type of person that gets, gets going on something. And if it doesn't, you know, morph and kind of change and have a little bit of novelty to it. The adventure kind of dies and it's, it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's okay, but I'd like to move on to something different. It's like what's on the other side type thing. Yeah. And that's why hunting is, is so perfect for my brain and how it works and you as well, you know, you and I both, we, we, we want to see the next thing. Like we want to see what's over that mountain. Um, mm-hmm. we want to see the next drainage, next mountain range. And we're in, when you're an outdoorsman and you're in this community, in this space, and you have this hobby, it's never ending. Like I just moved to Montana from Washington state and I feel like I have the biggest playground, you know, a big kid could ever want because I've got, I've got 20 new mountain ranges I got to start learning and that'll never end. Like there's an unlimited amount of mountains to learn lakes to fish to figure out rivers to fish to figure out and there's just always adventure there's always things to learn and, and you don't have to spend thirteen hundred dollars applying for the tag because you're a resident yeah absolutely <laughs> i did that That's yesterday ouchie <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i uh, i made the with with how tags are getting tougher to come by and how states are treating non-res these days um i think we made the best move this is the state i want to be in and raise my girls in but you know what drives my wife crazy dave is when we'll be driving along and i'll see like this big body of water and i'll tell her man you give me a couple months and i'll figure that lake out like i'll figure out how to catch those fish in that lake it's like i just want to dial it in spend Mm. some time there and figure out what it's going to take i'm surprised you haven't got into walleye yet i know it's there's just too many hobbies on the plate already. <laughs> it seems <laughs> like hunting. seems like my friends that uh, love fishing and they're in Montana, they get into walleye, and walleye kind of turns into almost like a steelhead-esque obsession. Yeah. I can't have any more of those because my girls now <laughs> are of age to where um, like, they're happy just going down to the Three Forks ponds here and catching bluegill, you know, and yeah. catching sunfish and bass and just how, how easy do you, fish to catch how do you remain a, a, a good dad through all this so what's what's really nice is now i do a lot of work from home so a lot of the year you know i take these big trips in the fall and i do spend a lot of time away um and again that wouldn't happen if i didn't have hillary i didn't have my wife to run the show she is very independent and that woman can handle anything that um you know, any catastrophe that goes on at the house while I'm gone, uh, honestly, I don't have a lot of worries. She'll figure it out. She's, um, she's that good. So that helps. Um, but I just try to be the best dad that I can when I'm here. So I don't miss any basketball games. I'll, I'll drive however far it takes from where I'm at to get to her, uh, Paley's basketball games and track meets and all that. So there's this long time where I'm able to be with the kids, um, throughout the year. And, you know, while we're at the house, we get to do a lot together. You know, the summertime, we do these 
Western Hunting Summits. And so they're with us the entire month of June out at a ranch where we hold these events. And that's like a big vacation. And then all through August. And I just try to be the best dad I can. And then, you know, obviously September hits and I got to spend my time in the woods. And uh, I think you and I, as well as a lot of other people in this community, are similar. If we didn't have that that um, time out in the mountains alone or with buddies doing that, we'd get a little grouchy over a period of time, right? I Absolutely. think that's what keeps me calm um, and just balanced is getting that time. And then, the you know, obviously the family time. Outside. Yeah, it's interesting so, yeah. that, uh, you know, because a lot of people would make the assumption that because you're gone so much, you don't get a lot of time with your family. But the difference is, is because you don't have like a nine to five, uh, in the traditional sense, at least, uh, you're probably actually home way more than most dads. Way more. So, you know, when I, when I look back at Washington state, I was putting in a crud ton of hours driving or just doing the business. So, um, that's what you would consider more of a nine to five or a, the regular type job. It was consistent. Um, but I was not seeing my kids for most of the week and then, you know, weekends and things like that. Yeah. Whereas now with the businesses that we've grown and the way that we've set our life up, um, you know, way more time to spend with them and I can still run the businesses. I can still do my work, but still when they get home from school, you know, it's, it's, it's fun with the kids. So yeah. That's kind well, of set, right setting your life up. I, I love that you said that. Like, it's an it's a it's a I guess a, a liberty that we have here in America uh, that some people take advantage of. Um, that's pretty amazing, man. Like, if you're willing to take, or you know, if you can handle a little bit of risk or a lot of risk, depending on the situation, and some patience and resilience and some have some vision of something you want to do it's amazing you can set your life up to where you know you can be saying what what ryan's saying right now it just it takes a lot of time and definitely some sleepless nights and i would assume right ryan sure. but uh i look at life the same and I, I i know probably a lot of the listeners do either do or want to look at life like that but it's pretty amazing you can set your life up like you have. I mean, that's a that's a really cool story, man. And I think your entrepreneurial genes have done you well um, to kind of yeah. say tradition. Yeah, whatever. I'm gonna I'm gonna live an adventurous life. And by the way, you should write a book. I know your wife always tells you this, but the rest of us want to know about those. Like, I wanna I wanna vividly experience through your book that those adventures in Kamchatka. And like all these places that most of us are never going to get to see. I mean, let's just be honest. Like we're all going to die and not have these adventures. So we're going to have a lot of adventures. But that dude, you have you have like a whole life's worth of really really cool stuff. So write a damn book and quit putting I, it off. I know. I'm I'm uh, I'm 48 now, and yeah, my wife is definitely uh, <laughs> hammering on me. Well, I had her book. on the other day, and she yeah. she said that she wants she she wants you to write a book. And I, I'm by trying, the way, I think I'm, I'm trying to get back into writing right now. It's funny um, when you stop writing for a while, you kind of lose it. Like oh yeah, I, I I have a hard time just stepping back up and getting on the computer and like writing down a story. It takes some like through COVID. I had COVID for a while. I had Giardia and then COVID, so <laughs> I had some time to like refocus and kind of re get back into writing and so i'm doing a lot of it now but uh yeah what's the what's the biggest tip that you that you could give a an average hunter that just wants to improve an average hunter that just wants to improve um like we talked about um i mean i can bring it all together as far as uh the whole trying to create more time for yourself, how you set up your life. Uh, I mm. think in your twenties, maybe into your thirties, when you're growing your career and you're setting up your life for your forties, which I am, I'm 48. I'm not like a spring chicken. It's taken a while to get to this point. So don't think that it just happened in my twenties because it definitely didn't. But, um, 
Cause I get questions all the time about people like, Hey, do you just hunt? Is that all you do? And no, I don't. <laughs> um, and these are a lot of these, these young gentlemen that ask that question are guys in their twenties and they want the ability to go do these 10 day trips and they want that lifestyle mm -hmm. eventually. But there's a lot of work to get there. And I think the forethought of setting it up ahead of time and thinking about what you want, um, makes a whole lot of sense and it'll yeah like be like uh out. having like a long-term vision like absolutely i know that's one thing that changed my life is in my 20 i didn't have any vision in my 20s and that was the opposite of you ryan i was like my vision was what bar were, were we going to go to that night and yeah, then yeah. wake up hung over and go fishing or hunting or something uh but when you get in your 30s and you know, let's just say you get married or have some kids or whatever you start actually thinking about the future <laughs> Uh, and some people are blessed. Some people like my daughter, actually all of my kids already think about their future. I did not do that. Like I was like, yeah. where am I hunting I next? Just that with my, my daughter as well. She's, she's thinking about her. Future yeah. So 13. if you have the forethought to, or like you, you listen to conversations like this or someone else that, uh, you look up to one of the common threads that you'll see is, is they actually looked into the future and they thought about where would I like to be 10 years from now? where would I like to be a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, like what would be the ideal setup? And then you like, it seems like with, with your life, you just kind of started headed in that general direction. Yeah. You didn't figure it out and you just still don't have it figured out. And you probably never will just like the rest of us, but you start heading in that general direction. And, and here you are, you know, in, in the middle of your life, and you have a setup that allows you to do these things that most of us dream about and think that we're not capable of, but it's simply not true for most of us. Yeah, you know, there are some circumstances where it's it's highly unlikely. Um, yeah, but sure. you know, you can. Uh, it just it's it's an inspiring story for all of us to learn from. That's for sure. Well, I think to answer your question, Dave, like you asked, uh, what can somebody do to be a better hunter? And I think I answered it a little bit, but spend more time out there doing it, spend more time gaining experience, uh, experiences, learning your craft. And, um, you know, like we've talked about, you need to set your life up to where you get more time to spend in the mountains to be able to get those experiences and, uh, and hone that craft. But I think that's more valuable than any tip or tactic I could give them as far as how to sneak in on a buck. Or what about the guy? Yeah, for sure. Or, what about the guy who, okay. So, you know, I'm a, I'm an electrician or I, my my like my life is what it is and I get seven days a year and I look forward to it all year to go elk hunting. Um, what's what's the tip for that guy? That's a that's a tough position to be in because well, like we talked about earlier, like you have to have really realistic expectations around that week. That's not a lot of time. You might draw a week where it's a hundred degrees. I've done this before. Like when when I lived in California when Sitka was first starting. I had to travel to go elk hunting because in California, you're not going to draw an elk tag or you have to be rich. Um, so when I, I had to like the month before September, like it's almost like playing the lottery, like pick my week and hopefully I get it right. And I remember a couple of years I got it wrong and it was like the worst week and it was just getting good when I had to leave and go back to work. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people fall into that boats, especially with how competitive tags are now. It's like if I draw Wyoming, I might have to pick the week I'm going there like now and it's still months and months and months away. So what's the, what's the tip for them that, you know, they have a limited amount of time and it's tough. I mean, I think it's an easy answer. I think, uh, and it sounds cliche, but preparedness, I guess, because, and, and there is so much we could talk an hour about what goes into preparedness from, the health aspect to being physically ready, mentally ready, which comes from the physical, um, having a hunt plan that isn't going to pin you in one area. And then when that area fails, you're scratching your head on the mountain thinking, well, now where do I go? You want a good hunt plan. You want other options. You want places to go to if there's people in your area or if, you know, if the, if the fog is rolled in and you only have two days left and the forecast says more fog, you want a lower country, lower elevation area, you can immediately go to stay positive and keep hunting. Um, positivity and constantly changing and adapting is, is huge because uh, if you've ever hunted with somebody who's not positive, 
and is a very weak-minded person that's easy to say let's just go home or easy to say let's just uh, let's just go back to the truck um you're not going to be as successful as you would be if you were with that guy like my hunting partner like brian he'll never quit on me he'll never he'll never say let's just bail on this this is too difficult he's always going to be let's try this let's go here that's the guy you want in your corner um staying positive makes all the difference on the mountain when things go tough because uh you and I both know, Dave, when you're hunting, things go wrong. Things don't happen like you think they should. And there's always, there's always abilities to just, there's always times when you want to say, let's throw in the towel, let's go back home, let's grab a pizza, um, let's get out of this weather. There's too many boot tracks. There's a million excuses. But it's, it's the guys that, uh, you know, when I look at positive people like, for example, Brian Barney, who maybe you'll have on your podcast, you'll quickly realize why Brian is so successful at bow hunting because he is go, go, go. He's as positive as they get. Um, he's always just pushing it. He's always pushing himself to Brian the is coming on today. No way. No, oh, yeah. perfect. So perfect good segue. Have on here. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. No. And, and that's why he's successful because he's never going to say die and he's never going to bail when he has two days left on his, on his time off it's always going to be pushing and going harder and just trying something else um that is absolutely huge now it's it's hard to tell people that they need to do that and expect them to do that but at least surround yourself with people that do and they they what's the difference between pushing through the hard things but knowing when to actually quit and change directions maybe it's not quit maybe it's just change directions I don't know that there's an answer to that. I think that just comes with your gut and that comes from experiences, um, Mm -hmm. on the mountain. It's really hard to define, you know, you've been looking at this basin for three days. Is it time to bail? Um, I think a lot of factors go in. Like, do you have another three spots that you were really had high hopes for that could be just as good, if not more, if not better? Um, maybe then it's time to bail. Now, if you saw a buck on the first day and you've sat there for two days and you haven't seen him, you know, maybe it makes sense if you got enough time built in that you stay a few more days if that's the buck you want. It really is a lot of factors that go into it, but it's a tough answer. It's a tough question to answer. Like, when do you bail? And I think you're right, though. I think it, it comes with experience and gut, you know, yeah. because yeah. it's a it's a tricky, tricky thing because... I've noticed, especially when you're sleep deprived um, and cold also would be the top two things. The easiest answer is, is like, ah, it's not working out. Let's get a cheeseburger and a beer, right? Like yep. it, it sounds so good. Like I, the heater at your, like you're, you know, I'm like, I'd love to be in my truck right now. Like yep. instead of in this fog and wind. So it's much easier to make that decision, but sometimes it's the right decision. Like there's been times that, I've moved or totally changed areas. I remember a couple, this was a year before last, the Rosies were just kicking my ass. Um, I was having a great year, but I'd missed a couple really nice bulls just with uh, limbs and missed ranges and just stupid mistakes. And I was kind of tired of the brush and the elk that don't bugle very much. And um, even though the hunting was pretty good, me and my hunting partners, my brother and my dad, we're like, we're going to central, we're going to go to Eastern Oregon because we want to smell some junipers and sage and listen to elk that bugle. And it was to an area that we hadn't been in a while. So we didn't even know if it was going to be good. But I, when the, the, the day, the evening we got there, I killed a bull um, and it worked out. But any, like when I was telling people we were leaving the area we were in, I had literally just missed a nice six point Roosevelt. Um, which would have been a close to a once in a lifetime for most people. Uh, and literally I'm like, ah, he's still here, but we're leaving. I'm tired of this. I, I just, I need a change of scenery. Um, and I'm confident we can figure it out somewhere else. Um, yeah. and it worked out, but I also could have made a horrible decision and we could have gone over there and it would have been shitty. And yeah. I've been like, Oh my God, why did I leave that bull? I know we could kill that bull. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's like an old adage you hear, 
uh, in Washington all the time, if you're a fishing guy, you've heard it, especially of blackmouth guys, you don't leave fish to find fish. Um, and that's just, but that doesn't always follow. Like that doesn't, it's not always true, uh, especially in the woods. Cause intuition is huge. I feel like, um, now sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, yeah, it's just a yeah, gut call. I mean, don't leave like... animals to find uh, to try to find other animals. Sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a gut call, man. It, uh, I have a buddy who's a great elk hunter, and he's much better at that than me. Like if I hear a bull, especially Roosevelt's, like Roosevelt's tend to stay. You know better than anybody. You've killed way more great bulls than I have. But if you find a good Roosevelt over here. Unless something dramatic happens, they're pretty much in the same area every yeah. year, every day. Yeah, they don't blow out 10 miles like a lot no. of monkeys do. So if you find of- one and he's susceptible to your hunting style and like if you spend enough days after him, you're going to get a shot. And, yeah. you know, it, it's just it, and I can't if you're say slow, this. slow, methodical and you make your plays right and keep the wind out of his nose, you should be able to get that bull. Yeah, they're not so going anywhere. It's hard to leave those, but I have a buddy who'll be like, no, I'm tired of that bull. I want to go somewhere different. And usually he succeeds, so I don't know what the right advice is. Yeah, yeah it's hard to explain gut, intuition. Um, I think my my thought is it comes with the more time you spend out there, mm-hmm. the more instances that you have, the more experiences you have, um, you know, times when it's not working out and then all of a sudden it di- it does. Um, it's just like the, like we talked about in the beginning, the, the last half hour of the last day, the bottom of the ninth type situations that tend to happen a lot. Um, if you've had that happen enough times, you're not so stressed out on day eight because you haven't filled the tag yet. Like you still have a day and a half left and it, oftentimes it gets filled. And, uh, and when that happens over and over and over and over again, um, you just expect to to find success at the end and it often is so i assume the answer more is than not it's the case the answer is the same on when do you know to be super duper aggressive and when do you know to sit sit your ass down and wait yeah yeah it's intuition yeah. Uh, again i think a lot of factors go into that you know when you're a bow hunter you know i my style tends to be watch that animal until he puts him in a spot where i am very confident i'm going to get my shot and there is no way that he's going to smell me he's going to see me he's going to hear me um there's other people very successful people every chance they get they're going to make that stock and they're going to be super aggressive their style works for them maybe it's a little bit different environment but my work mine works for me and mine is be patient um and you'll hear Barney say it because it's his famous quote, patience kills the buck. Um, but be patient, play the slow game, and uh, just be very methodical and make the right decisions because opportunities on public land, mature animals come very rarely. And so the last thing I want to do is blow that by just being a little bit too aggressive and going in and, um, you know, playing a 30% chance and, and missing my shot that could have came three or four days later when he's in a much better spot on the mountain. Well, let's talk about the shot. Cause that's the other thing I've noticed about you hunting with you. Um, and it specifically came in the form of a really rare form actually, but we were in Arizona and we saw a Kawadi yeah. and you really wanted to shoot a Kawadi. I really wanted to. And I wanted to see you shoot a Kawadi and you had like a 22 Magna. I don't remember what it was. It was some rifle yeah. and this Kawadi, Okay, so Kawadis, for those, Brian's talked about them a ton. I don't need to go, but but they're like a monkey like creature that lives in Arizona. They got a long striped tail and they like hang in trees and they're the craziest animal I've ever seen. And when you're a raccoon between a raccoon and a monkey, okay, somewhere in between there, I feel like. Yes. And if you're down in Arizona hunting uh, coos deer like we were, they're around. In fact, Brian got one of his bow uh, several years ago, but pretty rare it's almost like seeing a badger you know you, you know they're there but you pretty rarely see them uh anyways we see one and ryan really wants to take one you can take one uh i think one legally per year one, is that true per year, yeah. yeah and uh anyways so he 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 has this gun he brought specifically for this there's a little 17 hm 17 that's what it was yeah yep. 
And this thing, you can just see this tail moving through the grass, like just kind of weaving. And, and I got to be honest, I would have been unloading the clip. <laughs> but Ryan, and this is to his credit, I'm not saying that my approach is right here because it, it wouldn't have been. But Ryan is looking for a rest. He's waiting for the perfect shot. Uh, there was a couple times where we could see portions of the vitals, maybe a head, maybe a tail, maybe a butt, maybe a hind, whatever. But we, there was never a great shot, and you never took it. And I admired that about you because I definitely would have, and maybe <laughs> it wouldn't have been successful. <laughs> but uh, I think that kind of – because I and so since then, I've watched you shoot your bow – and I've 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 been with you on a couple successful hunts. I wasn't with you in the shot, but we've talked about the shot. Yeah. And one of the things you told me was is like you you have this it's really hard to be patient under a ton of stress. And when you're shooting at an animal, you're under a ton of stress. Your your brain wants you to get that arrow in the air. You've been waiting all year, so there's excitement, there's stress, there's adrenaline. But you have this ability to kind of stay cool and calm and wait for that right moment to hit your trigger or your thumb or whatever you shoot. Yeah. And you tend to be successful doing that. And that quality showed, showed me an, an intense amount of, even though it was a weird example, an intense <laughs> amount of discipline around shooting that I don't think most of us have. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was one of those cases where it didn't end up working out, but I just didn't, I didn't on that specific time. I didn't have, you know, I, I could have shot him in the face probably right? <laughs> could have shot him in the face, but I didn't like the shot. I did. I wasn't comfortable with the shot. I wasn't yeah. steady enough. I want a one shot kill. And I wasn't, I didn't want to just tap, 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 and hope for the best. And that kind of goes, which is the right with, way to do it with all things, you know, rifle as well as, um, with archery. Uh, I want to be sure that my heart rate is down. And I am so confident in my shot that it's going to be perfectly placed. Uh, it's just important to me, and I am very slow, and it will bite you in the butt on t on occasion. Um, you know, that's for sure, and it has. But I also feel like um, I've got a really high success rate when it comes to not wounding animals. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm really proud of. Uh, just making my shots count, keeping them realistic. Uh, Do you miss? close. Not, not, no, not very often. It's a rare thing. Now, I have missed with my rifle. Um, it's been a while, but yeah. Uh, it's, when it's is the last really time you rare. missed an animal with your bow? Last, oh man. That was a long time ago. That was back in my Idaho days where I actually missed one with the bow. Well, how long ago was that? It's been a while. About 10 years ago. That's insane. Or so. That's insane. Yeah. It's just, I think it's just uh, the sloth-like approach. Like, I'm just not going to wing it if I'm not confident in it. And most of the shots are close, um, which is You need to go access to your hunting. I think we could ruin affordable. your record really easily. Yeah, probably, right? <laughs> I hear they, they just duck your, uh, duck your stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I, I've been, I also feel like I've been incredibly lucky on some of these, um, bow kills with say the, the coos deer, because, um, like this last coos deer I took last year, you know, I had this thing at 18 yards and I felt like I had everything right. Um, he was going left to right. I had drawn in plenty of time. I was holding forever and as soon as I stopped him with a little bit of noise, uh, I, I was right behind the shoulder, again, 18 yards. And that little coos deer, and we all know how small they are and how jumpy they are, similar to an axis. He had time to, I had my arrow, I had my pin behind the shoulder. He had time to spin, and that arrow went full frontal and put him down quick. So I missed my, where I thought I was going to shoot, but it ended up, he spun right into it. And it was actually a more lethal shot. Um, I saw something interesting on your Instagram the other day. I wanted to ask you about, you said you've never shot at a, or the farthest shot you've ever killed an elk was 50 yards. Is that true? Mm -hmm. uh, with, with the bow. Yeah. With the bow. Yep. So and most of your taken, shots are. I've taken two with the rifle. 
Um, and those were somewhat close. And then, yeah, I've never taken an elk beyond 50. Now, uh, my longest shot with my bow was a 60 yard on a mule deer back in Washington. Um, and I almost didn't take that shot, but that, that buck stood there like a statue for so long. And I was so calm and my heart was down and I was just so locked in that I let it go. And, uh, it, it perfect double lung shot on that mule deer but that was the farthest i've taken with my bow and that was 60 that's insane i think and i think that's a really good message to be out right now you know and i'm, and I'm not going to get in a debate of long or yeah. short because i think i think people wound animals at short range at long range it, yeah. it i just think there's it's not that simple like distance isn't the only factor right no, but it's, it's gonna happen no doubt it, about it yeah yeah but it is it does take a tremendous amount of discipline especially on elk i mean i killed a bull three or four years ago at uh at 58 yards mm -hmm. um and i wasn't gonna take the shot but i was kind of like you but he like the sun was shining on him just standing there no clue that i was there like no impediments in the way and like my pin was steady i was calm so I just let it go and it drilled him and I, it worked out, but I've also had it not work out. And like actually one of my worst experiences with a bad hit was exactly the same yardage and exactly the same thing. I was calm. He was calm, but I hit him in the shoulder and the, um, this, this other bull and, uh, I never saw him again and it, I feel awful about it. Um, yeah. Uh, but anyways, the point I, being, I think it takes a tremendous amount of discipline because obviously you ha you've had lots of opportunities over 50 yards, but you're, you're getting tighter than that. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, like you said on that shot, there's a lot of factors. You, you have a lot of things running through your head as we all, all know at the moment of truth. And one of those is like you had animals that were unaware of your presence. So they're relaxed. They're not looking right at you when you release that shot because a 50 yard shot when that animal or 60 or 70 is, is focused on you. He knows something's not right at the half second that that arrow releases, he's moving and he has the ability to jump it, duck it, move bad shot, gut shot. Now, if he's just feeding completely unaware, um, you have a much better chance of putting that arrow right in the pocket at 50 plus but i feel like you're really taking a risk if they're on you and looking at you and tensed up ready to jump because they are super fast so so ryan lampers is is on a bull for 10 days and this bull walks by at 60 yards you're not taking the shot uh, i'm not going to say i'm not going to take the shot but if everything is right if he's unaware there and I have a shot that I'm super comfortable with. I know I can feel my heart is down. I've taken those those deep breaths, and I'm not jittery and just trying to punch the the shot off. Um, I might, I might. I won't say I I'm not going to. But uh, you know, if I feel like I'm amped up and target panic or something is just gonna like rip that thing off. Which I am very lucky. I don't have target panic. I'm very lucky. Um, I don't think you just, have the I physiology actually, to have target pain. I think you're, I think you're too cold blooded. Like, I think my heart slows down when I'm in those moments. Like it's <laughs> that's so it, annoying. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I get really calm. I shoot actually better on animals than I do on targets for whatever reason. I have a I, friend like that and I, I find it very annoying, Ryan. Yeah. Well, what makes me nervous <laughs> is not a live animal in front of me. What makes me nervous is when there's uh five dudes sitting around you mm. watching your every mo you know every move and you're having to make a perfect shot that gets me to shoot poorly it it it's it goes back to um i'm an introvert i don't like eyeballs on me it really like it destroys me so, how do you bring your heart rate down i just i, I just focus on it <laughs> i don't know if that makes sense but um my uncle is the one that um, we talked about this when I was young. He's because I don't know. He did a lot of sports. He's wrestled and and all those things. And he would kind of teach his kids, uh, the wrestling kids, how to kind of 
unwind yourself and through breathing, lower your heart rate and you can do it. Like you, I can, um, I can definitely focus on my heart rate if I, if I'm too jacked up and get it to drop and, and just lower just by focusing on it and trying to relax. Um, but yeah, it, it drives my wife again. One of those things that drives my wife crazy. I'm surprised we're still married. <laughs> well, I mean, being calm. It's one of, I think it's one of the most challenging things about hunting beyond anything else, bar none, in my opinion, is the ability to calm down when you're really excited and actually yeah. make a good shot. I think that's, I mean, that's why buck fever is what it is, right? It's a, it's a more natural human reaction to not do what you just described. It's much more, yeah. much more common. Like I am just naturally, uh, I have high anxiety just by nature. And so a buck fever which is but. crazy but because i'm actually a pretty calm person but i i am more susceptible under uh, a lot of stress and adrenaline to yeah. target panic and i've struggled with it my whole life minus the last uh four or five years since i've really got a handle on it via the help of our friend joel turner joel turner yeah um, but before that That's interesting you would never know what i was going to get like there was some animals yeah. i took that were i was like super calm and and I'd be like, oh man, this is, I'm over it. And then the next animal will walk by and I'm like, my heart's in my throat and I can't even get the bow back all the way. I mean, still most my embar my most embarrassing moment in uh, hunting was when I, I missed a bull on Randy Newberg's TV show at 12 yards with my recurve and I didn't even get the bow back halfway. Like it was mm -hmm. really, really embarrassing. And, uh, but now I, I, I wouldn't say that it's, I don't think it's ever going to go away within me, but uh, I've definitely found tools and educated myself and worked very hard on to get it in control enough to where I actually feel like 10 you know years there. So you're focusing on how mm -hmm. to prevent it. Yeah. You know how, when you're super stressed out or under a lot of pressure, like maybe it would have been in your earlier days, like you can't really remember the shot. You're like, I don't know, man. Like just came in and I shot him and there's blood and he's dead, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't really have that happen as much now. Um, I can actually remember vividly the steps I went through and like exactly what happened. But if you encounter a new hunter um, or you hunt with somebody that hasn't done it a bunch and you try to get them to tell you like what happened, like where'd you hit him? What happened? They'll be like, oh, dude, I don't know. Did you see? <laughs> you know, I feel like as you get further into it, you, and I, I think that's a byproduct of, that heart rate affects everything because it, it depends, you know, the, the, the responses that your, that your body has, if your heart rate goes over a certain level, like it's science, right? Yeah. Um, but my question to you yeah, is, it, it's funny because, uh, on that note, like I remember when I was a kid before I could drive, I was, I don't know, 14 years old, 15 years old. And we used to go to this archery shop out in Issaquah, Washington. It's called Salvino's Dick Salvino. Owned it. He was a great shot. Like the man could shoot. He's one of those, you know, guys that you go to the shop and you just, you know, he tunes the bow up and he gets you going. And he's just a good shot. And yet all he has when it comes to hunting stories are misses. All he has is North Idaho stories. The bull was at three yards and I missed over its back, five yards, 10 yards. He couldn't keep it together in the moment. He just, no matter how hard he tried, buck fever elk fever whatever shot, uh, target panic settled and that man could not make a shot on an animal um and it 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 confused the heck out of me at 14 i just couldn't figure it out you know like what what do you mean you missed it two yards like, how do you miss it two yards you <laughs> yeah. know uh and he's just like didn't even know what happened um for a man that could shoot so well put a pin on a dot and consistently hit that dot and yet when there's you know 800 pound animal in front of him he can't hit this giant set of lungs because his heart rate is in his throat and he just can't keep it together you just black out i have sympathy man it's the worst if you love hunting it's one of the worst things that can happen to you it's and it's it's so hard to beat it and I'm not even convinced you can you can beat it. It's so hard to actually learn to cope with it and harness it and not let it uh, 
have so much impact. I just think some of us are wired differently. Uh, I have a few friends like you that are just their brain. I think, I think your brain just functions differently and it, it's, it's yeah. just a little easier for you to get control of it. But man, it's just slow. It's just slow. You can say it, Dave. I don't care. It's just <laughs> no, no, no. It's just, a, <laughs> it's just, I think it's an anxiety thing. It's just, I think it's just a wiring thing. Um, but, yeah. but also I think almost everybody has to deal with it when they first start. Well, I take that back. There are some people that get into it and they're like, I don't know. I just went out and a 350 walked by me and I shot it in the lungs. What's so hard about this? Yeah. And, uh, but like, there's other people that, um, that are just getting into it. They're going to fight that buck fever for quite a few years. They're going to be like, oh my God, I have a buddy who he, he works hard, way harder than I do to kill an elk. Like, he is, he takes the whole month, but he's just got into it here five, six years ago. So he's learning through a fire hose. He's not hunting a great area, but it's all he can do. It's his only area he really knows. And last year he finally got a shot at a six point bull and it like stopped and its head was behind a tree and it was like 25 yards. It's like his, everything he's dreamt of since he started. And he's like, dude, I just lost it. I don't know what happened, but I sank an arrow in a tree above him and I am so sick right now like how could i do that like how is that even possible um so um that it, it just happens. happens and that's why joel turner is uh got a thriving business when it comes to um mental gymnastics of working yourself through a shot and being in control of your shot and uh it's it's huge and his son Bodie, who is gonna be world's greatest archer i think if he's not there already the kid is amazing uh, what is he 15 now he'll beat anybody i know uh he doesn't know what target panic is and that kid is incredible and that is because joel has from a young age got him to really be in control of his mind um what was his business called before shot iq it was like iron mind iron mind yeah yep. and that was it being being in control always and never just going into autopilot and letting that arrow fly. Um, Joel had target panic. He experienced it and he got through it. And now he teaches a, a class that's really great for people. And it really I, does help. You know, the coolest thing about Joel's stuff, I think it changed my life in a lot of ways. I think that, I think everything he teaches can be easily transferred over into any sport and any life endeavor where you have to, cope with high stress and not make bad decisions a lot of people make their worst decisions when they're under stress and uh, it's really hard not to because your brain wants to take the easy route and it's like flight or flight for whoever if there's anybody on here that hasn't heard of joel or uh, paid attention to his shot iq um, material it's life-changing but i will say and he says this uh what does he say uh it, it, it won't work for you. You have to work for it. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Uh, but my point was, is I've actually started using some of those tools just because I do have a natural proclivity to uh, proclivity to anxiety um, in my life. Like in business, if I have a really hard decision, I'm stressed out under a lot of pressure. And really what it is, I mean, at the end of the day, the bare bones of it is walking through the same process with every hard decision in your shot process or when you're hunting or in your life, like you're under a lot of pressure, you still have a, a, an amount of time that you don't think you have to walk through a process to help your brain make a, a good decision and not just an emotional decision, which is when you release the arrow into the air because your brain just wants to get rid of it and get out of this stressful situation. Life's a lot like that too. And it's hard. It's hard. But I've, I've actually found a lot of value in what Joel teaches and everything. Even golf. I play a little golf. Yeah. Go, shoot, man. If you got the yips on the golf course and you're missing three foot putts, it's the same damn thing. It's, it's target panic. It's your, it's, I didn't even know there was a term for that. Yips. Is that what Oh, it's the yips. And actually, <laughs> uh, dude, it's the same as missing things, man. It, it, I know you're not a golfer, but it, it works perfectly for that too. Well, it's, it, it transfers to a lot of things because, you know, Joel will tell you, take that extra second or two or three, and that makes all the difference to keep, you know, hold it to keep it is what he says, you know, stay focused and just don't just go on autopilot. And that goes with um, that moment of truth on a buck when you get that shot 100%. 
or even when you make the stock. Like sometimes it's just a little bit of extra time sitting back, making a better decision, thinking it through, building out a little bit more strategic plan than just bombing in and then hoping it happens and hoping it works out. Oftentimes it doesn't. So yeah, I think it transfers to a lot of different things. Whereas, you know, the shooting aspect, a couple of extra seconds to get that heart rate down to make a perfect shot maybe maybe it was just that a couple seconds is all it was going or to being totally okay with the animal walking away yeah yeah we used to do these train to hunt events and we used to have to you know you're running around you got a backpack on your heart rate's up and you know you come up to the target and depending on where you hit this target you, you know you don't lose any time if you ten ring this thing but if you're outside of it you get seconds added to your time and if you're way outside it or if you miss you got like 20 burpees, so you're way down. Um, so you quickly learn that uh, all it takes is just a few extra seconds beyond that point where you think I should just get this shot off because it's just a timed event and this is, I got to get across that finish line. Usually it was just the, the guys that would give it those few extra seconds that would make shots so they don't have these time, you know, hits on their score. So yeah, that was a big yeah. learning learning part for me um where can people find out more about you ryan and see all the cool stuff you're doing like with the western hunting summit and your supplements mm -hmm. tell us everything all the things all the things man there's a lot of things too right now it's there uh, is. West, western hunting summits are hot on my brain we're getting ready for those coming up in june those are four-day events here in montana great time good educators um a lot of fun so westernhuntingsummit.com, you can kind of find all the info for that. And then, yeah, with some of my wife's businesses, um, or her and I's business, Hunt Harvest Health has a lot of our content, whether it's recipes or products, um, not just the, the nutrition products, but the, um, you know, some of the other gear that we sell for rifle covers and things like that. But you can either find it on huntharvesthealth.com or stealthy nutrition cbd.com we also do cbd which is um you know the supplement world is a big part of um helping us out to uh, feel better in the mountains so sups and cbds and all those things we have it uh at stealthy nutrition.com right on man well i appreciate you coming on and i'm sure we'll do a bunch of these i hope so and i'm looking forward to some adventures in the future together we'll see what we draw this year yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, everybody. Time, my goal next time, Dave, is to get a backdrop as cool as yours. Because <laughs> I'm like upstairs in this little kind of <laughs> hideaway spot away from the noise. But uh, I got to get some antlers. We're going to make that cool, happen. Cool, cool setting. Like, well, you have more antlers great. than I do to make the cool backdrop, man. <laughs> this is, I'm in like a spare bedroom right now. <laughs> but, uh, well, I appreciate you, man. Let's do this again. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me on. Well, thanks for tuning into the Altitude Show today. Make sure to get out and support those that support this show. GoHunt.com, PeaksEquipment.com. Also, you can support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel or wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe there and leave a five-star review. Nothing less than five stars. We'll see you next week with a new guest. Have a great day, everyone.